Ja, schönen guten Tag allerseits. Herzlich willkommen zur fünften Ringvorlesung des Bevölkerungsschutzes. Mein Name ist Frank Fiedrich. Ich leite hier an der Bergischen Universität den Lehrstuhl für Bevölkerungsschutz, Katastrophenhilfe und Objektsicherheit. Und äh, wie Sie vielleicht wissen, führen wir regelmäßig diese Ringvorlesung durch, um entsprechende Themen Ihnen näher zu bringen, die wir in den Vorlesungen nicht so genau vertiefen können. Heute haben wir wieder ein neues Thema mitgebracht. Besser gesagt, es ist so eine Angrenzung an andere Themen. Aber da der heutige Vortrag auf Englisch sein wird, ähm, werde ich jetzt gleich ins Englische wechseln. Auch nochmal herzlich willkommen an die Leute im Internet. Sie werden danach die Möglichkeit haben, entsprechend auch über Internetchat und dergleichen Fragen zu stellen. So, okay, uh, now I would like to switch to English. So, uh, our today's presentation is about a really uh, important topic, which is resilience of critical infrastructures. So, we already had a couple of presentations about infrastructures and also about urban resilience and resilience. So, but the, today uh, we address something which is looking into the future a little bit, because nowadays we really look into the past and think about resilience, what could happen, but we don't consider what will happen in the future, so we look at emerging risks. And our speaker of today is uh, Sasha Jovanovic. Sasha Jovanovic is leading the Smart Resilience Project, which is a large European Union Uh, critical infrastructure project, and he will talk a little bit about this project in the context of critical infrastructures. But before I give the word to you, Sasha, I would like to introduce you a little bit. So uh, you have a couple of roles, and you see it on the slides. You are the director of the Steinbeis Advanced Risk Technology in Stuttgart, which is a consultancy in risk management but you're also located uh, in the EU VRI, the European Virtual <coughs> Institute for Integrated Risk Management, also in Stuttgart. Um, so you have also teaching experience in a couple of countries, Japan, the, the United Nations and uh, France, and you have a lot of experience in coordinating projects. You already coordinated over 50 projects, large projects in the different areas. <coughs> And you authored a lot of books. I think if I look at it on my slides, uh, it's already five books and over 200 publications. So you have a lot of experience and I hand the word over to you. I'm looking forward to this interesting presentation. Thank you, Frank. Uh, many thanks for the nice introduction. And um, a remark to everybody that uh, uh, in the discussion part and in that what we are going to look at, we can switch to German. That can be, so to say, my German, but uh, uh, hopefully it will be good enough to uh, understand each other. So uh, you look also serious this afternoon, and I hope that I will be able to cheer you up with some of the things, because um, no matter um, how um, serious your study might be, because you are now in safety engineering, safety management, security management. Uh, it is uh, also good to see uh, where the uh, points uh, in that, what you are dealing with, um, could uh, lead you to uh, wrong conclusions. So I'm not going to tell you that all what you are um, having uh, on your studies can be questioned, But at least in some places, you can ask yourself, is that what uh, uh, the experience, what uh, uh, the facts, uh, real or fake ones, tell you? Is it uh, really the good basis to make a decision? And in your case, it would be the decision related to uh, safety. I will look and take an uh, example of critical infrastructures. I will look many examples from the project, which uh, Frank kindly mentioned, and that's the project where also um, University of Uppertal participates. This is the Smart Resilience Project. You see the logo on the top saying that Smart Resilience Indicators for Smart Critical Infrastructures are the smart subject of this smart topic. So everything is smart there, but uh, uh, don't be fooled. <laughs> So the title of the presentation is um, essentially a um, challenge to check if uh, we can or could be uh, fooled by the past resilience or by the fact 
that uh, the past is telling us that our structures are resilient. Equally well, and this is the abstract which you can use when writing your homework later, so you can copy it back from, from there so you, you, you don't have to, to, to invent it. So uh, the title of the presentation could have equally been how to manage resilience in the um, age of information overload. And I have avoided another word which I could have added to this one um, in the case of false or misleading information. I would just, uh, um, and I will not be making any publicity for any project, for any organization, for any author, but in this area, there are a couple of very nice, interesting books, uh, uh, some of them written by, um, by uh, uh, Daniel Levitin, who is the um, pupil of Amon Tversky, who on his own has worked uh, with Kahneman, who has uh, uh, written the book which has uh, been a uh, very no well-known and bestseller also on German lists. And this book is talking about that fact that the overload of information, the too many information, are actually bringing our minds sometimes in a sort of a disorganized state. And so either we talk about organized mind as our goal, or we talk about the possibilities of misleading, and there he writes another book, Weaponized Lies, how to think critically in the post-truth era. So these are the things which I think are very important for what we deal with in safety and security engineering, because we already work there uh, with the informations which are very volatile, which are very... Um, uh, much loaded with ambiguities and uh, many uncertainties. And if on the, on the top of that, we add also the possibility of being misled or even spoiling this information with uh, deliberately false um, information, we then have to uh, really question uh, uh, our conclusions every time. Are they right based on that what we are, um, so to say, uh, wishing to achieve, and that is the safety and security of systems, infrastructures, products, you name it. In this uh, um, context, we can also talk and say, well, okay, we have so much uh, uh, information technology around us, and some of this is smart. Is this smartness going to help us? And in my presentation, I'm going to try to say that, yes, the smartness is helping us in many places, but uh, it can be in itself a source of additional, uh, so to say, problem for the conclusion. But after this brainstorming about the possible title, let's come to the original one, <laughs> and this one is Fooled by Past Resilience. Why do we overestimate resilience of our critical infrastructure? And that is something which many people from the police, firefighting, or other areas will uh, um, question. They will say, well, uh, look at our past and look how safe we have managed this or that and so on. You look at, at the financial infrastructure until the year 2008. They, especially after the Second World War, were always praising all what they have done, saying 1928 cannot happen again. And it happened. After that, after uh, this 2008 Lehman Brothers ha happened, nothing has been really changed in order to prevent that uh, something else, probably even worse than 2008, happens again. Because if you now make a sort of extrapolation and compare the scale of, 2000, of uh, 1928 and 2008, you will see a factor of three orders of magnitude. And the global range of the catastrophe of 2008 was never actually fathomed completely. So, let's see how it goes. I would just like to remind you, which you have probably already heard uh, in, your, um, in your lectures, presentations, and uh, tell you what uh, we understand under resilience. In uh, many sources, you can find many definitions, many different definitions. But in principle, we are always talking about the case 
when we say don't matter how probable or not probable or improbable some uh, event is, let's see what is going to happen when this event happens. So when this event, event happens, what do we want to know? We want to know is the uh, infrastructure exposed to this event, threat as we say, is it going to survive or not? And so in the project which I have taken as a reference, we say that resilience of an infrastructure in this particular case is its ability to anticipate possible adverse scenarios, to look forward and prepare for the outcomes of this event, possibly uh, looking for the, uh, for, the, for the option to be better off after that than it was the case before, because we are going to learn something, hopefully. So if we have a risk as a combine and, and, and uh, combine it with uh, vulnerability, threats, hazards, consequences, and so on, and we have a system, I hope that this is going to work, yes, and we have a system operating in a certain level of uh, functionality. Normally, it is something like 100% longer of, of operation. In the moment when this risk materializes, when this happens, you have um, the loss of this functionality. Uh, if you are producing electricity, you are not producing electricity anymore, or you are not producing electricity fully. And then after that, you try to recover. The um, uh, call it old concept of the whole story was very much oriented on uh, first of all achieving the, uh, the functionality level as before. So let's uh, um, let's uh, let's be there where we have before where we have been before. Nowadays we don't think anymore like this. We know that it is not going to be enough because uh, the structure of um, the infrastructure itself changes, the environment changes too, and if we want to, uh, so to say, um, achieve uh, anything which is, uh, uh, so to say, worth investing money and time in, I talk about recovery and the other phases, we will have to essentially be better than before. But the classical approach is, as I said, uh, very much concentrated on achieving the functionality level as before, and um, uh, proving that after the event, the system will not find itself, for instance, in, the, in this case here, of a complete um, failure, or that it will not be possible to uh, fully recover its functionality. So as Frank mentioned in his introductory words, we, in uh, this project, in, in the type of research which I'm uh, trying to be more involved in, we have tried to enrich this concept a little bit. We were saying and thinking that uh, uh, we should pay a little bit more attention to this event which is causing this disruption and to check how can we uh, organize all our actions and measures so that at the end of the whole cycle, and this here what you see is called a resilience cycle, so you have a, an adverse event happening and you get uh, the function lost and then all a recovery after that. So we would like to have infrastructure which is able to transform and adapt. So this is a new concept which you will find in many places and if you, if you uh, look at those who are leading World Economic Forum, uh, OECD, all of them are actually pushing this idea that we have to go further after uh, something happens. And this is, uh, um, so to say, easily to say, easier to say than to, uh, to materialize, but at least it has to be said. So if we start talking about resilience, then you should always be thinking about resilience as uh, something which is closely related to safety and risk. So if you have um, uh, uh, risks in the real world, and if you again want to think a little bit heretically, not only as the books say, then you should better start thinking about risks which are around as an iceberg. Why? Because uh, the 
uh, what we see going and looking from the top is essentially the top of the iceberg which we know and these uh, which we know and these top of the iceberg this can be our known risks in your study you are dealing today primarily with known risks fire fire protection various catastrophes disasters but all of them known nobody is uh, at this moment so to say um, really uh, uh, in an organized way in the world, not only in university, but also in other organizations, really talking about uh, what and how to deal properly with the part which we don't know. And this part which we don't know are these emerging new unknown risks which are actually looming under the water. I mean, sharks and icebergs are not easy to combine, but you should think about it like, like this. Because um, uh, we essentially um, can say uh, that uh, uh, the biggest threats uh, which uh, any of you can name in, at this moment and tell that uh, this is something which is, uh, so to say, being, uh, of, uh, being your concern and which is on your horizon, we can just ask any of you now, you will be saying, okay, I'm maybe uh, my risk is to be late for the dinner today or to miss the train or I don't know to lose my 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 phone my iPhone or something like that so these things will be known and the companies today organizations today they essentially when they deal with this they make a catalog of known risks you will admit it is difficult to make a catalog of unknown risks so for these unknown risks we have only two possibilities and these possibilities are to look at some indicators, something which we, it is going to tell us that uh, we might experience some new type of risk. And the other possibility is to look at that, what is going to happen afterwards. If you think about it all together, you will understand that uh, um, talking about safety, uh, risks and uh, sustainability at the end of the day is possible only if you look at these two parts together. So concentrating only on one of them is probably not going to help you. And when you now look at the resilience as a, as a phenomenon, you should possibly look at something altogether within an integrated concept and have a corresponding methods and tools. Do we have these methods and tools to, to today? No. We are working on them? Yes. Do we have some globally accepted concept of, um, uh, of, uh, of risks? No, again. We have uh, things which, like a patchwork, go from one part of the world to another, one country, one organization, and so on. So if uh, you look at the infrastructures in particular, you have one more um, or several other problems. One of them is that uh, uh, our society as a whole can be seen as uh, big infrastructures of infrastructures. So we have um, uh, a lot of, um, uh, of, of points where one or the other infrastructure can fail and failing can bring the overall infrastructure, the whole society to a failure. Uh, now we have here, okay, we don't have it, um, no, no problem. Um, we can of course say that it would be very nice to have um, the uh, overall concept and the, one of these concepts of the idea is coming from the states, Argo National Laboratory colleagues from the from, uh, from, from this area, have produced a sort of a maturity model saying that is how it should all work like, and we should start analyzing one infrastructure and dif different aspects in this one infrastructure, and then expand this concept down to the whole world and look at the whole world as an infrastructure of zillions of infrastructures. Just to remind you, you are probably in your study going to hear that you have Seveso uh, plans, for instance, in Europe, 
And uh, we uh, all know that uh, in, in uh, just at looking at these particular plants, we have thousands of them. And these are just the plants where you have some chemical uh, and dangerous substance, substances which can be a danger. You are not looking at other infrastructures for which are equally numerous. So you come there here and you see that uh, we uh, essentially have already, if we, even if we don't look at emerging risk, new things, we have a complicated situation, but if we add unknown risk on the top of that, we get exactly that, what I was mentioning there uh, in this information overload and the possibilities overload. Efforts which we have around is to put this um, complex word uh, somehow together and to say, uh, like World Economic Forum, these are these guys who are sitting at this moment now enjoying the expensive hotels and good food in Davos in Switzerland. We will see that they are looking at different aspects, which uh, I think I'm doing something wrong here, but we'll see. Thank you. Okay. So you will see that they are looking at different types of problems and if they come uh, to infrastructure, they even try to create some tools which will tell you that if you want to look at the different aspects of infrastructure management, including safety and resilience and risk of infrastructures, you can then see and link the factors, for instance, in this case, project life cycles, knowledge and collaboration, who has to work with whom, and so on. So the tools are there. And having said this, we essentially have zillions of, uh, uh, um, of different uh, possibilities to, to look at these connections. So the question which we have from, uh, to, to look at from the practical point of view is um, that we definitely have to go and put some order in this, to select this information which is needed for the proper management of this. So we uh, look uh, on one side of dependencies or interdependencies, interdependencies being a bidirectional relation between assets, in this particular case, critical infrastructures. And we try to characterize this and create a system in which we can model the whole behavior of the whole system. If you think about, uh, the, about a system, for, for instance, like the one which we are considering in our Smart Resilience Project, you will see that uh, there we, for instance, uh, consider a refinery, and then in this refinery some accident happens. When this happens, it uh, propagates in, with its uh, uh, further influence to transportation system, to the healthcare system, water supply, and, and so on. And Already with a small number, we are now not talking about thousands of service of plants in Europe. We are talking about eight plants here. You have something which brings you headache. And if you look at the experience so far, human mind is not um, capable of going further than the third level. You third level of, um, of, of effect. You say, I have something here that can cause something here and that in turn can cause something there. What you, what you get at the end, after the best guys around with the highest IQ cannot go beyond, beyond, beyond the third level. So the idea that the smarter systems are going to help us um, is uh, best seen in, uh, for instance, uh, recent events of um, Hurricane Irma. Uh, we have seen and seen lots of photos about uh, poor journalists who were trapped in expensive hotels and making the nice pictures and photos through the hotel window. But very few reports were provided, for instance, about patients of, um, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a hotel for, not a hotel, of a, of a place for home for elderly persons who died, 15 of them, uh, because uh, the uh, um, the electricity company was not able to recover fast enough to uh, restore the air conditioning system in, uh, in uh, their building and uh, which directly caused the death of them. 
Why? Because the electricity company had a too smart system, which had, was controlled from one center and was optimizing uh, and was optimized for a normal operation. So we have always to think about that, what the smartness of the system is going to bring us as an advantage and as a di disadvantage. So why, if we know old things, and I'm certainly, I'm probably and almost certainly not the only one who is talking and thinking like this, why do we lack the readiness to deal with this? One of the, of the answers to this is our institutions. So that what you, what you learn in your study is very much, uh, I don't know if you can see the mouse now, now you, now you cannot see it, okay. So we'll talk about the uh, uh, left column of this. We, we talk about instrumental solutions. In these instrumental solutions, you have a simple problem, one dimensional usually, and you say, if my, I don't know, pressure is higher than this, I have to do this. If this is like this, I have to do this. Institution uh, or is then normally an agency who tells you this is allowed, this is not allowed. I'll give you a stamp or I don't give you a stamp. But our uh, problems today are not one dimensional. As you have seen before, we talk about uh, problems which um, uh, require a lot of expertise. Then suddenly you have experts who do disagree, who do not uh, talk, uh, talk together. Um, we have uh, um, the problems where the society as a whole has to be included. So you cannot solve the problem of Stuttgart 21 just by asking experts. You will have to talk and, and, and see what all the stakeholders think. So that is something when combined with our silo organization of security and safety organization is a big problem and the readiness to overcome these problems is usually limited to political statements. In the future, this level of organization is going to um, collaborate much better with this level of collaboration, of, of, of this level of uh, police, firefighting, whatever. And then you have the uh, proverbial case of um, firefighting in southern France. Uh, it is uh, quite some many years ago where uh, the Italian firefighters wanted to help their French colleagues. And at that time, this was, as I say, many years ago, they were not able to help because their, uh, uh, the, the, the equipment was not fitting on, on both sides of the, of the board. So we have to go out of these silences. We have to, for, uh, uh, to, to, to change this uh, independent operation of, uh, of, inf of our um, of our administration and organizations which are involved in the situation of interde interdependent infrastructures. Now we come to that, what I was saying at the beginning in the title, why we are and why we can be fooled by uh, that, what, um, what uh, the, this complex world in front of us is, uh, so to say, um, telling us. The catch is that uh, <coughs> If you ask people, and some psychological experiments and the books which I have mentioned, we're doing such experiments. We, when you ask people, would you like to have more information in order to deal with this, in this particular case, safety and risk problem? Would you like to have more information? Everybody says, yes, 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 yes. If you do a real experiment after that, you see that the willingness to use and uh, think clearly about this information will decrease. So you will have a curve like, again, we, okay, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know what's going to happen now, but we'll see. So you have a curve that essentially you will uh, not have the, any benefit of additional information. And that is really important thing so that there is a sort of an optimum level of information and we usually in our safety and security things do not think about providing optimal level of information to the users. Now I will ask you, oops, now I did it rightly, right? <laughs> so if you, if you now, um, I, would, uh, I would like to see one advertising test. 
And I will ask you, I will interrupt it at the, at the, at the moment. This is, uh, this is an attention test. If those of, some of you have already seen this one, I kindly ask this person to keep, keep silent. <laughs> so if we now um, go to this test, and I hope you can hear the, the thing. Just, just how much attention Skoda, it's not the Mercedes. The we left one parked on this ordinary road in West London. We wanted to see if its sharp crystalline shapes, bold lines, and lower, wider profile would attract the desired level of attention. Will the 17-inch black alloy wheels stop passers-by in their tracks? Will the angular headlights attract the attention of other road users? Will a crowd gather to check out its fresh, sporty look? Have you seen anything uh, specially exciting about this thing so far? Anyone? I mean, I, maybe, maybe we can, we can we just, just say, tell me, have you seen anything spectacular here in this boring advertising, right? Publicity for Škoda, not even a Jaguar or something like that. Has anyone seen anything? Okay, so that is the expected result. So if we now manage to continue. Well, not quite. But did the attention ceiling design distract you from noticing that the entire street has been changing right before your very eyes? Don't believe us. Have another look. Did you spot the van changing to a taxi? How about the scooter changing to a pair of bicycles? Or the lady holding a pig? Let alone the fact that the entire street is now completely different. Didn't think so. So there we have it. Proof that the new Skoda Fabia is truly attention-seeking. <laughs> okay, so as I said at the beginning, I'm not going to do anything which is uh, uh, or can be used as a publicity making. So I'm not I'm not uh, making any advertising for Skoda, for Levitin, for anyone. OECD, World Economic Forum, don't mention it. So the question is, and I'm that's the final part of my presentation which I'm trying to say from my humble perspective, what could be done now? What now? We, when we have such a situation, what kind of a practical method can we use in order to improve the situation? We are not going to change the world. When we finish our project next year or whenever, uh, uh, the world is probably going to have a lot of, uh, uh, of, of Škoda Fabias or, or whatever was it. And uh, so we have to do to see what kind of a contribution we can make. The first contribution is to organize, organize mind. So we want to try to organize this knowledge in such a way that we can organize and focus our attention on, on one side, issues of interest. And that is what, uh, what is uh, uh, shown here in this um, green uh, boxes. So for every phase of the resilience cycle, which we have mentioned at the beginning, understanding risk, anticipating and preparing, absorbing and withstanding, and so on, we actually define issues on which we concentrate on, and we, for each issue, define the indicators how we are going to measure it. The catch will be to keep an eye on the context, on that street which is changing, and for this one, we are still so to say, working on this in the right way, because everything what we find around us is not really helping us. So in, when, we, when we then do this methodology and define these issues and indicators for a very complex system, which has, uh, as I say, five phases, but then is exposed to different types of threats like terror attack, cyber attack, uh, flooding, you name it, and involves different infrastructures like ICT, energy, transport, ICT standing for information-based uh, um, infrastructures and so on. Then we have proposed a sort of a method, steps, how to look at this, and uh, uh, obviously uh, tools for this. In this understanding of the surrounding, we have proposed a different type of tools. We have actually proposed to address exactly this data which are distracting us. So we concentrate the classical methods on formalized steps, indicators, issues, points of interest, Škoda Fabia, with the analysis of the surrounding. And as in the surrounding, we have a network, 
what are we going to use? We are going to use these measures and these characteristics which are important for the network. So we are going to look at the network and probably this is not the subject of your study today here as students, but in the future it will have to be because this amount of the information around us is um, uh, exponentially growing and it will continue to exponentially grow including the exponential growth of threats. So we will have to look at the complex data, the complex systems as a big huge networks and look what kind of measures we can use. So you are probably aware of uh, moving average, uh, um, mean, uh, median, all kinds of uh, statistical measures which you probably have learned uh, already uh, or, or have, uh, have um, talked about. But uh, in the future, I think in the, uh, in the, in the um, uh, toolbox which you are going to use as engineers, safety engineers also, you will probably have to start learning a little bit more about um, the things like uh, like centrality, like betweenness, strange English, English words, which are going to tell you how the network in itself is organized. So it will tell you if a network is vulnerable. In, for instance, if you compare C and D and you see that D has one node on which everything hangs, this is going to tell you I have to do something with D. And other measures can be taken. And if you now come to that area which is known to you. This is an example which our colleagues in the projects have done. They have looked at the network of policemen. So a uh, network of policemen uh, were uh, in, in, uh, exposed to, um, to two different cases. In one case, they had a, a sort of uh, announced exercise. So they said, tomorrow we will have a firefighting exercise or some other exercise. And in the other case, the exercise came as unannounced. And what you could have looked through it was to see, and this was in Hungary, so for uh, those of you asking what kind of a language is that one, that's the, 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 the Hungarian, you could see by following the communication lines, big data, telephones, uh, emails, and so on, you could uh, see what is the, uh, um, so to say, the characteristics of the network, you could look what kind of a clustering are creating just, we, uh, just by uh, looking who is talking to whom, not, uh, not spying what did they talk to each other. And at the end of the exercise, you can measure the new things between us, cuts prestige, centrality, and other things in the same way as you measure, for instance, median or, uh, or average value or something like this in the conventional um, uh, con conventional uh, way and then you can say that for instance um, uh, in the in the prepared and unprepared uh, exercise you have found these and these places which can be can be improved so <clears throat> having said this we can do the same thing and the same type of exercise with uh, uh, different data I have prepared here one example which I'm going to skip but I will finalize this on uh, the uh, practical problems which are now closing and approaching to that what, we are, uh, what you are doing in, in everyday practice. So having an infrastructure in this particular case which we look at smart cities, smart health care, uh, smart energy supply, what happens to these structures if you go, <coughs> if you expose them to terrorist attacks, cyber attacks, uh, uh, information technology specific events and similar and uh, in um, <clears throat> our particular case um, I will just uh, um, take uh, uh, one of the of the examples in, uh, it is the example from uh, from an airport uh, exposed to a terrorist attack uh, the idea there uh, was that the terrorists uh, would the first attack the um, the um, information system, disabling the detectors for uh, uh, the safety check of equipment and luggage, and that uh, that would allow them to bring in 
uh, an explosive device which would then be a terrorist attack combined with this. And then what you, what you see there here, and what I really want to stress in this particular case, there you will find exactly these things which you are talking about in normal studies. You will see that, uh, uh, I don't know, having emergency plans is important, that having incident investigation here is important, that having um, uh, safety and security by design and looking at, uh, for instance, camera coverage and number of uh, uh, crisis management trainings, all the things which people already do now, that you can put this information, once when you reorganize it, you can get a sort of a network which helps you deal better with the network of complex problem in the outside world. So, having said this, I will um, then really stress the, the last point that in the future, in all that what we are doing, we will have to look at the big data um, in order to see the interdependencies and other things. I'm again just showing you how this use of this, this big data can, can give you and how in some of the cases it can help you reconstruct the particular cases like for instance the crisis in USA. Obviously you recognize here an event and then this event leads, this is again the result of one of our colleagues in, in, in the project. We're leading um, to the um, disaster in financial science. But then if you look what has happened in other professions, postal and courier and other, other areas, you will see that some effects in some areas are bigger and some others are smaller. You can do this type of analysis in many other cases. And to a bigger surprise, uh, which you can uh, actually um, at the beginning hardly anticipate is uh, that what has been known in history for ages, that in the craze, in some of the crisis events, there are people who can profit out of this. So you see, if you, if you have here different countries like Austria, Czechoslovakia, uh, Czech Republic, uh, uh, Luxembourg, Hungary, and so on, and we, you have um, a problem of, uh, in the manufacturing uh, of textile industry in Germany, that in this particular case, for instance, Austria could be profiting out of this, which, I, which is not intended to say anything negative about Austrians or Austria, but just saying that, uh, uh, that you have to have a need, that you have to have a model. Of course, come back to that, what we have said at the beginning, you need also to know uh, where are the limits of this model. Because if you, as I say, um, uh, as I have said several times, uh, if you rely on these models, you can rely only if you know uh, where are the limits of this model. Where is uh, um, that what, uh, so to say, the information, not all available information, but properly selected information is going to give us the hint of what is going to happen with our infrastructure. So if we really want to know, is, uh, are we going to have a case of adaptive behavior after the, the, the cycle or collapsing behavior and so on, we must be able to deal with these emerging and systemic risks which burden all the work which we do. And in theory, we talk about interdependencies, but uh, if you think, even if you, if you make a sort of a normal interaction uh, uh, modeling between persons, you, re you rarely, when you say, I'm going to tell, to Frank for instance, something, and I can imagine this step very easily. I can imagine next step, and uh, uh, I can imagine what is going to be his response. To, to his response, already my response comes to the level of hypothetical. But in the normal, world, in the normal daily operation, I even hardly think about what is going to be Frank's response to my comment. So we are usually thinking unidirectionally. And so we, instead of talking inter about interdependency, talk about dependency. How do I depend on Frank or vice versa? Not how the two of us, and this is a very dangerous way of thinking. That's the, so to say, um, 
the, 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 the way of, of, of thinking America first or America second or things like that, because this is the wrong way. Then, uh, as I said, intuitively we have our limitations. These limitations uh, are really, um, um, so to say, leading us to the, to the limits. So uh, we uh, have to see here and have to see here also how the visualization can help us in our project. For instance, IBM in Israel is really putting these complex situations in a very easy, um, um, so to say, uh, uh, visualization forms and so on. So we, we can uh, uh, use different types of this, but uh, what is um, important to understand that more and more uh, this uh, complex aggregated world, world is going towards uh, the um, organization which looks more and more like swarms. Swarms means that in the past, uh, you know, we were relying and we think even today that we are not influenced by the behavior of others and we are. We think that we behave as individuals, but we behave as a society. We behave like, <clears throat> like, a, uh, like a swarm of insects or swarm of birds. And uh, this, is, uh, uh, mm, this is just a fact which we were able so far to um, neglect to a very high extent. In the future, it's going to be less the case. Why? Because also our smart friends are going to, uh, to start behaving like, uh, uh, like a swarm beings. So if you, if you look at the newest developments in the uh, uh, technique, technique of robots, you will see that, you, uh, yeah, that the, so to say, the primary development, the most important development is not necessarily on the, um, in, in the area of large robots, but the small robots and use of many of them at the same time. So you can go and check, for instance, some of the nice warning, uh, warnings which are coming from some professors at the, at the American universities, which have created also yet a nice video, which I'm going, not going to show you uh, uh, due to the time constraints, but go after that and see what you can find on swarm bots. And you will see that these small robots, which are not piloted by men, which are just behaving like bees in a, in, in a swarm, are the future which, as every future projection, has its positive and its negative side. So how we can, uh, so to say, uh, act as individuals, humans, as a society, in order to prevent that we meet the challenge of big data, of fake news and other things, I think the answer is simple. Through the lectures like this, and other things. So if we start talking about, if we start working and finding the methods on how to deal with it, informing, uh, and, and maybe uh, after, uh, after such a lecture, you will be, so to say, interested to, to search for yourself about it, something has been done. And of course, sky uh, is, uh, to say that sky is the limit is of course a nice thing, but it is, uh, um, it is uh, uh, good to remember that the sky as itself is just, uh, so to say, result of a human perception. Sky, which we see, does not exist as a physical object. You know, we see it because we are humans. When we look up, we see because our eyes are constructed like that. So uh, the limits uh, if you want to, to know it is, uh, and, and describe it like this, is set up not by physics, but by ourselves as humans. And we should remember that as safety engineers, security engineers, everybody who is interested in one or the other way in the aspects or the issues of risk and resilience. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sasha, for this very inspiring talk, and I hope we have now some time for discussions. And I would like to open the floor. As mentioned earlier, you can ask, auch auf Deutsch. <laughs> ask questions in German, also auch auf Deutsch oder auf Englisch. 
Gibt es irgendwelche Fragen? Das war doch maybe, so inspiring. You, yeah. <laughs> maybe uh, I start with, uh, with a question. So uh, you pointed out the importance of metrics and measuring resilience and uh, the importance of indicators because if you don't know to what degree you are in the one way or the other, uh, it's very hard to see whether you are in a good state or a bad state. Um, how do you feel about the acceptance of indicators in industry at, at the current stage? Is it a thing industry is more and more accepting or do you think uh, they are hesitant to, to work with indicators? So, so what is your feeling on that? Well, uh, it's, um, I think like with many other things in, in life important, uh, to establish uh, the link to the direct benefit which is coming out of this. Because uh, um, if, uh, if, you, if you ask yourself how have we ended up in Europe in having metric system? Was it because this metric system is so much better than any other system? Or uh, because somebody has ordered? Even, uh, um, so to say, some Prussian kings were not able to order that many things and, and it was the benefit uh, of use of this system which was bringing people. So, uh, people to the point that they accept these indicators. So, uh, whenever uh, we now um, start uh, talking about indicators, we should always try to see and show to the uh, uh, as we always call them, end users, what is the benefit of having this? And what is going to be the benefit for our infrastructures? So how much industry do we have here around Wuppertal? Dangerous industry, dangerous plants. Chemical industry, there's... Yeah, I have, I've seen from the train some of the bear plants and so on, right? So uh, you would probably be interested if you are living uh, 100 meters away from this, uh, from this plant, if this plant is safer or uh, less safe than maybe a plant uh, in France or so on. People are protesting today because of French nuclear power stations. Uh, I've been uh, uh, recently, due to my, so to say, other line of activities, involved into the assessment of um, the safety of uh, two Bel Belgian nuclear reactors. You know, they have, uh, they have uh, um, 30 plus uh, years of operation and have uh, thousands of crack in the main reactor pressure vessel. And uh, the, they, they, they have been put back to the operation and I personally wouldn't like to live, uh, I mean, if, I wouldn't like even to live in Buppertal. You are closer to them than I'm, than I'm here. So, in, than Stuttgart. But so this is something, this measurement and this acceptance of indicators this is going to be uh, there if we always envisage and give the visible and tangible benefits to the people who are concerned. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any additional questions or remarks? Are there any remarks on the internet? <laughs> so the, there's a remark, many thanks for the nice presentation, uh, which I, of course, uh, agree to. Um, maybe one additional thing. You were talking about emerging risks, and that's, of course, and you showed this picture of the iceberg, mm -hmm. which is, uh, of course, uh, very nice and, 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 and highly relevant, especially in this dynamic world. So we don't know really a lot about the risks. Um, Again, I would like to go to the end users uh, and, and their acceptance of emerging risks. Do they feel that it's important? Uh, because as you mentioned earlier, when we went back, we, we, they used their checkbooks, guidelines and uh, risk assessment. But now they live in a more dynamic world and they have maybe to adjust to it. Uh, when you talk to these people, do you think they really are aware of these risks? Aware in the sense that they are really willing to change their actions? Well, don't, don't forget that the extreme emerging risk is the, is the risk which you don't know anything about. So if you, if you say, I, I'm going to accept or not accept the risk which I don't know anything about, uh, it's a sort of very hypothetical question. 
A better question could be, do we have trust in the people and organizations who might be and are in charge like our future safety engineers who are going to be in charge of such a, such a thing. Because I'm afraid personally that in the future, the firefighter or the people who find employment in firefighting part of the, of the system are not going to be that much interested in, I don't know, police part of the system, or that they are not going to be interested in chemical safety and other things. So we have to have, and we don't have it at this moment, this global overall view. We talk about globalism in the sense exporting cars to China, but it is not it. it global doesn't mean only global in the, sense, in the sense of the globe, of the world. It means also, there's a second meaning, meaning of the world global. It means also total view, integral view. And that one we still need. And then when we have this one, we will be able to ask people not, are you afraid of, uh, I don't know, some asteroid hitting the Earth? Because this is something which is, which is unknown, which, which things which we don't know how it will happen. We will have to ask them, do you have trust in your safety engineers? Do you have trust in the organizations which are in charge of this? And I think that if uh, and we don't have this, uh, this survey or we don't have any representative survey that I know of, which would be saying and asking people, do you believe that in the case, for instance, of some of these potential very hypothetical emerging risks, our society is well prepared. We were uh, uh, we can always uh, uh, come to the point that some of the politicians or somebody else stands up and say, we are the schaffness, uh, but then, uh, uh, you know, uh, after this short sentence, there must be a system, there must be a set of measures, how are you going to deal with this? There must be a plan, because otherwise you are not going to be, I mean, you can say, okay, if, if an asteroid hit Earth, we are going to do it, we are going to handle it. Mm. But how, who? I mean, we had e examples which were bringing us to the very brink of a global catastrophe. In another volcano eruption, which, uh, can, uh, uh, which are not so, uh, um, so hypothetical as one might think, because we think always in the range of 2,000 years, but all uh, geological and physical phenomena in the nature have a much longer scale. We can have a much stronger uh, uh, extreme weather, space weather phenomena, which can hit our infrastructures in such a way that they will never come back from this. Uh, and we don't have the system, the infrastructure, and the mindset of the people who, which, is, which is going to help us deal with this. So that is why it would be so important that in all our project, we mobilize as many people as possible, talk to our other project, and not to satisfy some commission or somebody, but because it is our professional conscience to, uh, so to say, um, do the best. And so we have to commit of doing best, and I'm glad that I had the, this occasion. I really want to thank you, especially for this possibility to speak to the, to the people, uh, to the young people who are going to devote their careers to this, uh, to this activity, to tell them that it's not going to be about the job, about the payment or the salary, it's going to be about devotion to making this place, uh, if possibly, slightly better. Yeah, thank you very much. That was a very nice ending and uh, thank you very much again for this presentation. Uh, and with that, I would like to come to the end of this presentation. Uh, and we have a next e-lecture in the fall semester, so this was the last session, and we are looking forward to see you all there. Thank you.